Hi, spine and nerve friends. This is Dr. Julie Hastings here again, talking about pelvic pain. Um, please excuse my voice. I'm a little sick, thankfully not COVID, but um, still sounding a little raspy. So there's a lot going on, going around out there. Be sure to wash your hands. Um, but today I'm very, very excited to be interviewing my friend and colleague from the Denver days, Shireen Serafi, who is a pelvic physical therapist. Um, Shireen graduated from Boston University in 2013. Since that time, she's been working in the pelvic health field and advocating for broader access for patients with pelvic floor dysfunction. Most recently, she founded the Pelvic Health Physical Therapy Program at Denver's Public Health Safety Net Hospital. Her clinical interests include rehabbing and preventing obstetric anal sphincter injuries, assisting patients in returning to all functional activities, including sex, pain-free, and caring for gender diverse patients. In her free time, she enjoys running, playing tennis, reading, crafting, and perfecting her tadi, is that how I say it? Yes. Recipe. So um, as I mentioned in my interview, I learned so, as I kind of grew my interest and um, knowledge of pelvic health and pelvic pain, I learned so much clinically from the pelvic physical therapist I worked with. But even more so, I was inspired so greatly by the pelvic physical therapists I had the opportunity to work with. Um, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a more intelligent, committed, compassionate group of healthcare professionals. And um, Shireen definitely leads the pack with that. So super happy to have her here. Um, so Shireen, this will be pretty informal, um, but I think a lot of our listeners, you know, it's kind of a range of pm &R docs, residents, medical students. Um, so a lot of people probably don't know much about pelvic physical therapy. So this will be an introduction um, to a lot of them. So first off, what led you to becoming a pelvic physical therapist or heading in that direction? Yeah, so that's a question that I think anyone who works in this space gets because as you mentioned, pelvic physical therapy is not something that's really broadly talked about or that we get much education about either in PT school or even in medical school, really in any of um, the allied or health professions. So I first became exposed to physical therapy when I had an injury in high school. I went to PT because I had an ankle injury and I decided this is a pretty cool profession. And I went in knowing that I wanted to really, or what I thought I knew was I wanted to help rehab people who had sports injuries, people like myself. And pretty quickly in PT school, I realized I don't really know that this is something like, I really want to work with people who are having everyday health issues. And interestingly, where I first became exposed to pelvic health PT was actually through my dad, not because he was a patient, but because he had listened to NPR and he heard about pelvic health PT and he thought to himself, he's a bit very business-minded, what's like a niche that Shireen could go into that would help really diversify what she can provide? And I think he thought it would be more profitable for me too, which is not the case. So, <laughs> so paternal of him. So, so <laughs> paternal, right? So he was like, I think you should look into this. And then I started to realize, actually, this would really meet some of the needs that I'm looking for in my professional professional career. I'm going to be able to help people who have everyday concerns and I'm not one to be bashful. So the idea of talking to people about issues with like pee, poop, sex, babies, all of that pain. I was like, no, this is a space that I think I could really hold for people. And oh, it was very, awesome. very important. And I think undervalued issues until you have an issue with them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it was something that I thought, you know, um, I found it fascinating was also one of the other things. In addition to knowing I wanted to work with people who had more day-to-day -day issues, I was like, this I think is really interesting. And like, yeah, how can physical therapy help? Cause I'd never heard of physical therapy in that context. So that was really my entrance. And then when I was in PT school, I did everything I could to just absorb that information to know, okay, how can I make sure I get a clinical experience that's in pelvic health? How can I make sure that I um, have a mentor from PT school who's in pelvic health? And that's someone who I, who I still collaborate with. Um, so a lot of it was doing exploration on my own, um, in addition to like, you know, having some really great mentors along the way. Great, great. And so, um, 
should be referring, be referring or which patients should be referred for pelvic physical therapy? Who would benefit? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a, a few different ways to think about this. I like to tell people that I help patients with any type of urinary. I tell patients, I tell anyone, I help with any type of urinary, bowel, sexual dysfunction, anything that's related to pelvic pain, that's um, NSK in nature, as well as anything pregnancy or postpartum related. So if people are or for instance, urinary dysfunction. If patients are having really bothersome urinary frequency or urgency or leakage, absolutely send them to physical therapy. In terms of pain, any patients who are having pain during sex, any patients who are having pain in pelvic pain, and it's not related to anything imaging related, there's no cysts or fibroids or any other components, which is very common with pelvic pain. In most patients with pelvic pain, all of the imaging is negative. And then for a lot of those patients, physical therapy is absolutely should be first line care. And then um, in regards to pregnancy and postpartum patients, I really recommend anyone who's pregnant or postpartum touches base with the pelvic floor PT, both for um, birth prep and then also, um, also for rehab afterward. And then um, most PTs, including myself, um, are comfortable working with patients all across the gender spectrum. So I think often when we think about pelvic pain, we think, or excuse me, when we think about pelvic PT, we think it's very much skewed towards postpartum women. And I think it's important that we change the narrative that really we see any type of patient wherever they are in the spectrum, whether it's cis men, cis women, patients who are non-binary and all of our trans patients as well. Great, thank you. Yes, super important that I think when people think pelvic issues, they just think of cis women mm -hmm. and everyone has a pelvis. Every Anyone across the gender spectrum has a pelvis. Yeah. So yeah, the pelvic anyone floor. can benefit. Yeah, and a pelvic floor. So, you know, many, many people could benefit from pelvic PT who might be outside of uh, the people that are generally thought of as pelvic PT patients. And I think these populations are even more underserved as far as pelvic floor dysfunction. Absolutely. Uh, so how should a referring physician kind of explain or prep a patient for their first pelvic PT visit? Yeah, absolutely. Or kind of pitch the idea of pelvic PT to a patient. Totally. So sometimes I think there is probably a pretty big opt-out rate for people who want to come to pelvic PT. Part of it is just that we really get into the nuance of what pelvic of what issues people are having and they're often really intimate issues. And I think we know as healthcare providers that there are a lot of barriers to entry for patients to even talk about these issues. So maybe they've talked about it with another provider and they've been told, you know, I don't need to, I don't need to do anything about my pain during sex. I just need to drink a little bit more wine or they've been brushed off or for so many reasons, there's a lot of shame that comes with all of this. So I think first and foremost, making sure that however you talk to a patient about this, that it's just a really welcoming experience. And it's really like, hey, we're here to help you. Um, some things that I think are helpful are starting with what your previous experience with other patients have been saying, you know, I know you're having this issue and here's what we found on all of the testing that we've done. Here's what I think is really causing the issue. It sounds like it's some pelvic floor dysfunction. In my experience where patients have seen the most benefit is doing physical therapy. Here are some practices that I suggest for physical therapy where my patients have previously had some really good experiences. And what you can expect at that first visit is that they're gonna talk to you all about the issues that you've been having. We're gonna continue to communicate as providers to make sure we're giving you the best care. And they may, they're gonna assess you like a physical therapist, um, maybe like physical therapy you've had before in the past where they may look at your back and your hips and your belly. And then they may do a pelvic exam if that's indicated, but also only if you're comfortable. So I think providing some context as to why you as a provider think it would be helpful, letting the patient know that you're gonna continue to work collaboratively with that PT. And then also trying to provide some context, like, you know, when you went to PT for your knee, you're gonna see somebody who's like trained in that type of physical therapy and then also has this additional training. So then it makes it seem not so foreign for people. And that's normally how I start my visits where I ask people if they've had physical therapy for anything else before. And they'll often say, yeah, but not for this. And I'm like, oh, but you know what? You have some good context. You know how, how this whole system kind of works. And then what I do is just a little bit more specialized. Great. And could you explain, or could you kind of define pelvic floor dysfunction for yeah. those who don't really aren't familiar with the idea? Yeah, absolutely. So 
in terms of, we'll start at the anatomy. So the pelvic floor is a group of muscles that sits in the bowl of the pelvis. It goes from the pubic bone in front to the tailbone in the back, it's in the back, and then all the way across to the ischial tuberosities. It also attaches at the coccyx. And these muscles are essentially, they're the bottom of our core and they help us with a variety of things. So they help us with remaining continent, they help us with sexual function. They also provide stability because since they're the bottom of our core and they're, they're more endurance-based muscles, they help provide a lot of stability and they also provide support to our pelvic organs. So when we think about pelvic floor dysfunction, we think about it in a few ways. One consideration would be, so pelvic floor dysfunction is really an umbrella term and we can, we can come, we can think about it a few different ways, one of which being pelvic floor weakness. And that would be more typical for patients maybe who are having stress urinary incontinence, that coughing, sneezing, laughing, or prolapse type symptoms, feeling, or prolapse, I should say, feeling the symptoms of pressure or headiness or something falling into the vagina. And then we can also think about pelvic floor muscle tightness or hypertonicity as another way. And those patients are going to be more likely to have pain. Maybe they have pain during intercourse. Maybe they have pain just throughout the day. They may also have constipation and some outlet dysfunction, like they can't get their pelvic floor to relax enough. And then another way I think about pelvic floor dysfunction is um, in coordination. So maybe those are patients who try to contract their pelvic floor, but are actually pushing out. And then they're wondering, why am I leaking? What's happening? Or maybe they're trying to push out or bear down to have a bowel movement and actually they're contracting their pelvic floor. Very helpful. Um, and I think it's uh, important for people to know that pelvic, um, pelvic pain is not necessarily just in that perineal region, but can be felt in the lower abdomen, the buttock region, even sometimes um, up towards the, the low back or the lumbosacral spine. Yeah, absolutely. I remember in my training as a PT student, my one of my clinical instructors said, the pelvic floor can refer anywhere from the knees to the ribs. And that's really something that I try to talk to patients about, especially in my current work, I see a lot of, a lot of cis women with pelvic pain. And a lot of the belief is that this is my ovaries. This is my uterus. If it were my pelvic floor, I'd feel it only in the vagina. Um, and really, you know, often when I assess patients pelvic floor, I can reproduce some of that pain by touching their pelvic floor. And then it's like, it, it helps patients with that buy-in of saying, you know what, I had negative imaging. And then also she touched just one spot and it did really reproduce that pain. Maybe there is something else here, but since as a society, we don't really know what the pelvic floor is, right? We just sit on it all day. We never think about it. So the idea that there's not just holes down there for urinary and bowel and sexual functioning is really mind blowing for people. I was surprised when I started seeing patients with pelvic floor dysfunction and showing them the pelvic floor model or images on the computer and, you know, people, including medical professionals, don't necessarily know or think about the fact that there's muscles down there and those muscles do not, I mean, they play such a key role in urinary function, bowel function, sexual function, but they also play a key role in stabilizers of the hip. So mm -hmm. patients with intraarticular hip pathology, there's a significant crossover with pelvic floor dysfunction. Mm -hmm. um, patients with joint hypermobility issues, even patients with, you know, lumbosacral um, spinal instability often have pelvic floor hyper hypertonicity to kind of compensate for that. So a lot of our patients you might not think of as being a good pelvic floor physical therapy candidate are likely to benefit. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree with that more. I would say anyone who you're seeing who has an intraarticular um, hip injury, absolutely, their obturator internus is too tight. Like I would say there's such a, um, and that's one of your pelvic floor muscles, and there's just such a connection there between what's going on with the hip and what's going on with the pelvic floor. And also just thinking about the fact that the pelvis, it's adjacent to, um, the pelvis and the pelvic floor is adjacent to the hips. It's adjacent to the abdominal wall. It's adjacent to the low back. And there's such carryover there. And really the pelvis is like grand central station of load, load transfer, right? So everything that's happening, that's going, any force that's going through the foot is then going back up to the pelvis. So I think that that's important context to think about of just like, where is the pelvis located and what other things could be impacted? Another population that I think um, definitely benefit from, uh, from pelvic physical therapy is our postpartum athletes or our pregnant or postpartum athletes when they return to sport, especially high impact activities. Yeah, there's actually some really great guidelines that came out of England in the past um, two or three years. I apologize. My understanding of time has been really altered in the past. <laughs> 
but that can you and everyone else <laughs> yeah right where there's some really great return to run functions um excuse me return to run testing that can be done for patients that i utilize all the time with any of my postpartum athletes and i think um it's there, you know, when we think about as we allow patients, or I should say clear patients to go back to activity after having a baby, there's really not many guidelines that patients are given. And it's important that there's at least one field that's able to provide people with these guidelines, because we want to set these patients up for success, you know, because if some pelvic floor dysfunction, let's say it's weakness goes untreated, that's that could lead to some an intraarticular hip injury that could lead to chronic back pain. Um, and how can we make sure that we're setting people up for success and those guidelines, I think, are really key to that. Great. Um, so can you walk me through just the beginning or the eval of a pelvic yeah. pain patient? Yeah, absolutely. So basically the first thing that I do is when patients get checked in, I do give them some paperwork to fill out. And I think that that's helpful sometimes for setting the tone and the context because people will realize, okay, like she's asking me some pretty intimate questions because that paperwork is about urinary, bowel, sexual dysfunction. I'm lucky in where I work, we have an incredible integrated pelvic health team that I know you know about. And often patients have some pretty good context when they come to see me, but not all the time. Sometimes people are coming from other providers within the, the within our hospital system who maybe haven't really prepped the patient. So patients come in and we just kind of sit down and chat. And I always start with that question of, have you ever had physical therapy before? And then I explain what I do as a physical therapist. If people have never had PT before, I explain I'm an expert in the muscles, joints, bones, movement of our body. Then I also explain why I work in that clinic in particular. I work with integrated within an OBGYN clinic. So I explain, I'm here to help people with urinary, bowel, sexual dysfunction, pelvic pain. And then I also usually say, I know I asked you some really intimate questions in that handout and that paperwork that I gave you. And that's why, just to help provide some context. And then I just start with the history. So we do a lot of talking at that first visit. We have 45 minutes and I explain, I'm here to get a history from, I've read it in your chart, but sometimes that feels like telephone. So I wanna hear it directly from you. Here's my understanding of what's happening. And then I do a lot of reiterating back to patients. Like here's what I, here's the timeline that I hear, here are the symptoms that I hear. And here's what I, here's what I'm understanding bothers you the most. And then I explain to patients so we, once we get a pretty good history and you know, whatever, patients are allowed to bring up whatever's comfortable for them. And also say like, I may not wanna talk about that at this time. I think an important thing to remember whenever we're doing any type of care, but particularly pelvic pain related is to have trauma informed care. So I appreciate asking patients about like giving patients a space to say, here are some things that we can do. Here's some options that we can do. For example, for an exam, we can do a pelvic floor exam where I use a glove, you know, my gloved lubricated finger and I assess the muscles internally, vaginally, um, or if it's indicated rectally. Um, and I, I show them on my model exactly what it's going to look like. And then throughout the exam, I give them multiple times to say that they want the exam to stop. Um, but also I tell people, that's certainly not something that we have to do today. Cause sometimes patients are like, maybe that's something I'm never going to feel comfortable doing. And that's no problem. Or they say, you know, I never realized we we're going to do that today. I'd love to do that at a different visit. No problem. And then I just explain, I'm going to instead look at your hips, look at your belly, look at your back. Um, and just explain to patients, really trying to pull the pieces together because when patients have been on this journey of having had pelvic pain, they've seen a lot of providers by the time they see me often and they've had pain, it's already chronic. And part of the issue is within the medical system of what makes this chronic. When it takes patients, you know, 18 months to get to the right place, that's not the patient's fault. And I just try to bring the pieces together and really reassure people you're in the right place which is something that we're going to continue to work on. And it's not going to get better tomorrow, but you know, this is how many visits I think will help things get better. Um, and after I've done that assessment, whether it's a pelvic floor exam or whether it's a more classic MSK exam that we think of in PT, then I give them some homework and some things to work on. And then I really set the precedent for, set the tone for, you're going to have homework for PT and we're going to work on things in between. It's so important for you to, to come to your appointment so that we can work on things here, but also so that you know what to work on at home. Um, and yeah, that's usually how things go. Great. That's super helpful. Um, so what would you say, what are some of the more rewarding aspects and more challenging aspects of working with the, the pelvic pain population? I know you see patients with other types of pelvic floor dysfunction, but the pelvic pain um, population. Oh yeah, absolutely. I would say it 
there are so many highs and so many lows. I think that there are more highs, absolutely, or else, you know, none of us would do this work. But I think one of the things that I find most fulfilling is being able to confidently tell patients that we are going to provide them the best care that there is. And I think really being able to sit with patients and say, I know that you have not had the greatest experiences in healthcare because maybe your provider didn't have the knowledge or didn't have the time or didn't have the empathy to sit with you and to give you all of the resources that you needed. So it feels really, com it feels really rewarding to, to help patients and say, hey, we got this, we're gonna figure it out. And we really take a teamwork approach at our hospital to make sure that we're, we're, we're managing this from all different aspects. And having patients achieve their goals, it's just, there's nothing that feels better than that, right? It's like, you know, I, um, a population I really enjoy working with are patients who have never been able to have intercourse due to, due to pain, whether it's vaginismus, vestibulodynia, or just pelvic pain and are the more general term of dyspareunia, which is pain during intercourse and allowing, like being able to get those patients to get back to sex is just, oh my God, unbelievable. Like, I just like, I have chills just thinking about it. Um, because I think there's so much that's tied into, especially I, I'm a cis woman. I work with many cis women and so much of what we've been kind of taught as women and, and where we where we live in our society is their worth and their value based on like being able to like engage in intercourse with their partners. And I think being able to help people take at least that, that section, or I should say that part away from their concerns about like their relationship or their concerns about their own self-worth and just or starting a family. If that's something people want to do. Absolutely. Using a tampon. Like I think just feeling comfortable and all of that. Um, I think that that's probably one of the most. Or being able to tolerate a dying exam, to be able to have a pap smear and annual, their annual exam. Yeah. Like let's make sure, make sure you don't get cervical cancer. So I think that's huge. And one of the things that I appreciate the most. Um, and then on the hand on the other hand of the things that are challenging, like it takes a long time often for patients with pelvic pain to see an 80 or hundred percent improvement. And I think it can be hard to sometimes have to say like, this is still going to take time because as a provider, you know, there are always other things you can try and you know that, um, that it's going to take time, but sometimes it can be hard even as a provider. And I've worked in this space for like a decade to say, okay, like maybe I don't know exactly what the next best step for this patient is. And that can be hard when it, you're like, oh, this patient has been through so much. I don't want to put them through anything else that they don't need to go through. But um, yeah, the nature of it is really challenging. And anytime you work with patients with chronic pain, it's so multi-layered, right? It can't be. I know yeah. I do counsel patients often that sometimes chronic pain has to be thought of not as something that can be fixed, but something more like diabetes that's, that's managed. Um, and I think that that's something I run into too, especially with pelvic PT is my yeah. patients come back and say, I went to two visits and I'm not better. Like, yeah. It's, yeah. I, I wish you were, but it's, that's Same. almost never the case. <laughs> it's good. It takes, it, it took you a long time to get here. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a long time to unravel the issues yeah. and get to where you want to be. And I think that management aspect is so important. And I think that also helps everything's about expectation. So how can we reframe this for patients about here are expectations and like, here's what I think is reasonable and anything beyond that, that's even better than what people thought is a bonus. Um, and I do think there is an element of management and then also really important. I know I've talked about how we have an interdisciplinary team, like having, a, you know, having this collaboration between PTs and physicians, having this collaboration with psychologists psychologists, having this collaboration with also like GI docs too, because there's so many um, different components that, that um, impact these patients and it's important to address all of them. Um, anything important to, I know there's so much and I feel like those of us in, who have an interest in pelvic pain and pelvic floor dysfunction can just talk and talk and talk about it. So it's hard to narrow it down, but any other key points or kind of takeaways that you think is important for medical students, residents, MSK providers to know? Yeah, I think absolutely getting to know your pelvic health PTs in your area. 
And I think there's a variety of ways that you can do that. I think that, you know, my guess is a lot of pelvic floor PTs are probably, especially in private practice, are probably reaching out to providers. And I think, um, and I think that's great. I think getting to know the patients who have, who've done physical therapy before and had good experiences, getting to know those providers. Um, and then I think also, you know, you can always like look at the American Physical Therapy Association has a locator for pelvic health physical therapists. Um, so I think that that is probably one of the things that I think is really key um, and having a good, good relationship with those other PTs because um, it really is a teamwork approach. And I think we all, um, whenever you work with patients with chronic pain, I think as providers, sometimes we're at the risk of burnout because we want to be everything for those patients. And we really empathize and resonate with those patients because they've had such a hard time for a variety of reasons. So I think making sure you have that teamwork approach is always really helpful. Um, I'd say that's probably one of the biggest things. And then also, I appreciate you brought up that the patient was saying, I didn't get better after two visits, really setting the expectation of the fact that, you know, you've had pain for 15 years. I think this is going to take, you know, you might be in PT for a year. You might be in PT for longer. Maybe you do six months and then take a break and then come back. Um, and of course, always making sure that patients know, like, if you don't like that PT, it doesn't mean physical therapy isn't going to work for you, but maybe you and that PT weren't the right fit and we'll find you somebody else to see. So I think those are probably some of the most important factors. Great. And so you mentioned the APTA website. If someone yes. wants to get in touch with a pelvic PT to shadow, to build a relationship, to refer patients, yes. is that the best way? Or are there any other um, yeah. Any other resources to locate pelvic that PTs? Way, that is a good way. Um, also pelvic guru. So Tracy share, she has a website where you can also look up a directory for physical therapists. And I'm happy to email both of these to you, Julie, if that would be helpful. Um, and then also like, yeah, I'll post these on the, um, the episode webpage for anyone who's interested. Yeah. So whenever I have a patient, let's say he's moving out of state and we need to find them a PT, those are the first two places that I look. And then otherwise I'll just Google and be like, all right, who can I find? Um, and I think some things to look at in terms of, um, how do you know what physical therapist is right for you? I would say their PTs do a really good job of putting on their website, the types of diagnoses that they treat. Um, and I think that it'll be probably be pretty obvious what patients, what PTs feel more, more comfortable treating than others. Cause those things will be really highlighted on their website. And then also as physical therapists, um, in terms of like the letters at the back of our name, sometimes people will have a WCS, which is, um, it's uh, a women's health certified specialist. I imagine we're going to be changing that name or like a PRPC, which is a pelvic um, rehab practitioner. And those are just people who've done, like we've done additional training in order to have additional training and really additional testing um, to prove our competency in those things. So we are clinical experts. Certainly not every pelvic health PT has to have those letters or does, or like is going to provide substandards care if they don't, that's not what I'm saying. But if you're just like trying to sift through things, that is one way to think about, okay, I know those people have at least done a different level of training and testing to have those letters. What do you think some of the barriers are for people to access pelvic PT like insofar oh. as insurance coverage oh. and so, re so the regions of the country, things like that? Absolutely. I think um, there's so many barriers. I think, first of all, there are not enough pelvic health physical therapist. I think that's just a reality in PT school. I can remember getting a singular lecture and it was essentially about pregnancy and postpartum, um, or excuse me, just about orthopedic changes in pregnancy. And there's a little bit about stress urinary incontinence. And I knew at that time, I was really hungry for information about pelvic health PT. So I would say for that's a huge issue. I think also the fact that we don't always as pelvic health PTs have great exposure, right? So I think podcasts like this are great because we're teaching more providers about what we can do. Um, so I think that the more providers who know about us, that's going to be better. Um, and when we talk about like insurance, so physical pelvic health, physical therapy is, is covered if someone has PT benefit within their, within their insurance plan. But the way that the model has gone in physical therapy for pelvic health PT is that a lot of providers are out of network. And I know there are so many people in the space who are trying to make sure that our patients who are uninsured and underinsured can get access to PT. Um, 
And I think that that's something that we're working on as a profession, but that's certainly a barrier where often it feels like the only people that are taking these patients are asking for um, out-of-pocket payment. So I think that that's a barrier. And then I also think the intimacy of having to share share about some really intimate symptoms, maybe share about some intimate trauma is really challenging. And we don't have pelvic health PTs throughout through, across every part of the state, every part of the country. So I work in a metropolis and, you know, I think about if I were to work, let's say in really Southern Colorado, like I don't really know what options there are for patients there. So also how realistic is it going to be if you have trouble paying for gas within your small town to then go and drive two hours each way to see physical therapy. And one of the only benefits I would say of COVID is the accessibility that we have now with telehealth. And I think as PTs, we'd always prefer to be inpatient, excuse me, in person. But if we can access and provide care to patients, telehealth, that's absolutely better than nothing. So um, my hope is that at least some of those barriers will be improved as we continue to think more about telehealth. So much, Shereen. I I learned a lot today. I learned a lot from you every time, um, and I'm sure I'm sure most of our listeners have learned. I'm sure all of our listeners have learned a ton about pelvic PT and how it can be utilized to help their patients, maybe even themselves, but um, definitely you know their patient population as a whole. So thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Um, I'll post the links that Shereen mentioned on the um, episode notes so people can access them. And we look forward to speaking with you next time. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Hastings. This was lovely. And I appreciate your intro so much. So kind. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone.